late start. We'll see uh, how stable the setup is today. Um, guys aren't the only people that have wireless problems sometimes in this room, so. All right, welcome back. Welcome to Friday. It's great to see all you guys here. Um, so today we're going to, there's a couple of uh, ideas that we need to introduce uh, that are sort of just in the vein of cleaning up some topics that we've covered already. Um, and then towards the end of class, we may have some time to go over a couple of examples together. There's definitely one uh, that I know that we'll get to, and then perhaps we'll have some time to answer questions if you guys have questions about the homework or whatever. Okay, so today's sort of like kind of a wrap up day, right? We're getting to the end of our discussion of, of functions um, and basic comparative programming, and then pretty soon we're gonna be launching into a new unit in the class, a new starting point where we'll start to talk about a different uh, different feature in, in the Java programming language. All right, so, uh, but, but first of all, and, and so this is our concern today, right, and going forward, even as we introduce new language features in Java like object-oriented programming, we're still going to focus throughout the second and third halves of the class on, you know, how do we solve problems using computers? How do we think about how to approach problems using computers and, and learn to think about problems like a computer science? But today, I need to talk to uh, you a few, introduce a few more things about functions, um, just to clear up some things that you might see that might confuse you. All right, but first thing I wanna do is just check in, right? So we're about, um, you know, this is like the third week. I think it's, you know, just over two weeks of class time since we started on Wednesday. Um, the MP is out. I see that some people have started on the MP and are getting some work done. Other people are sort of lingering. Can you not hear me in back? Yeah, okay, thank you. Is that better? Better now? All right, so how are people doing? Good, that's one answer. Any questions or concerns you guys have about how things are going? I mean, um, I've been sort of checking in with the staff. They feel like things are kind of headed in a good direction so far. Um, you know, if you have not, how many people here haven't really started EMP? Be honest. Okay, it's time. Yeah, uh, it, it really is time. Today, you know, you guys missed the whole day yesterday. We had office hours from 12 to 8. There were a lot of staff down there. They're very excited to help you. They've been trained. They're ready. They're prepared. They know what you guys have in front of you. Um, get in this weekend, right? So, so here's the thing about the EMP, right? If you start it, and it turns out to be easy, then you're done, right? And if you start it and it turns out to be hard, then you have more time to finish it. So it's a win-win, right? There, there really is very little to be gained by procrastinating here. It's not gonna take you less time, right? I mean, I am a firm believer in the idea, you know, somebody said, uh, when you wait to the last minute, it only takes a minute, right? Um, unfortunately, with the MP, that's not true. If you wait to the last minute, it takes as much time as it was gonna take you except it's a lot more stressful, it's a lot harder to get help. Um, you know, the days, so when we, when we release an MP, that Tuesday, that Thursday, that Friday, these are good times to come in office hours. Once you get to the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, it's gonna get busy down there. Monday, you know, for the people that have Monday deadlines, is gonna be, those are gonna be busy days. and It's gonna be much, much harder to get help and much harder to make progress. So. We put a lot of time and energy into recruiting a big, very excited course staff to help you through this journey. Um, let them, you know? Like, how many people have not, how many people have not been to office hours yet? Again, be honest. Okay, put it on your to-do list for the next few days. Go to office hours. How many people have been to office hours? Has it been awesome? Okay. The, the staff is fantastic. We have like the best course staff on campus, right? They're helpful, they're knowledgeable, they're supportive. Um, they're there to kind of keep you going, encourage you. They will help you from time to time with some technical things. Uh, but office hours are also a great place to just go and work. Then you're surrounded by people that are having the same problem, right? And you guys can talk about, you know, how things are going and you can discuss in English how you've decided to solve different parts of the MP. That does not constitute cheating, okay? You know, working together, being like, oh yeah, I got that problem and here's what I did to work around it. If you can describe what you did in English, fine. As long as your English isn't like, then I wrote if, space, open parenthesis, whatever. Um, so yeah, please, for those of you that 
This is kind of like, I feel like until you sort of cut your teeth on EMP, you haven't really started this class, right? I know that we've been giving you homework, I know we've given you the quizzes, but the EMP is a big part of what sort of marks this uh, transition you guys are going through into the field of computer science. Okay, um, partly because it's by far the most realistic thing we're having you do. The homework problems are great for learning, but that's not, when you go get a job at Facebook, Google, Instagram, some new cool startup that's changing the world, they're not gonna have you do daily homework problems. Right? That's not the kind of work you're gonna be doing. You're gonna be thrown into working on a big complex system somewhat similarly to what you do um, on EMP. All right, so back to talking about functions. So when we talked about functions, I told you that when I set up a function, I shouldn't, I can't have two functions with the same name, similarly to how you have two variables with the same name. So it turns out that at the time, I apologize for this, I lied. I, it turns out that in Java, you can have two functions with the same name. I'm gonna show you how. Um, I always like to review this. This is now 10 years old, but you know, this is a good thing for you. Has anyone ever seen this article before? You know, 10 warning signs of a bad professor, right? Um, this is from 2010, but I, I feel like this is probably timeless advice. The professor is boring. I don't know, but some of you probably think I'm boring, right? I like this though, if it's a snoozer in week one, it's gonna get excruciating by week 15, right? Um, I feel like I probably am okay with most of these. Um, the, the, let's see here, never involves the students. Um, un, un, assigns an undoable amount of work, right? Some of you may choose to quibble with this one. Um, just, but, but the interesting thing is, it doesn't say anything here about the professor saying things that aren't true. So apparently you can teach a course about just made up material, and as long as you don't have petty rules, you're fine. All right. But here's how in Java we can actually get around this, right? So we can actually have two functions of Java with the same name. Um, we shouldn't need, I fixed the playground the other day, so we shouldn't need these static keywords anymore. Let's get rid of them, okay? So there it is. So now, in my little snippet, I've actually defined two functions called sum, right? One of them is starts on line one and the other starts on line four. So the question is how? How am I allowed to do this? I told you I shouldn't be able to have two functions with the same name. And it looks like based on this example, let's put, let's put some, uh, let's put some, uh, print statements in here, so just so we can, because you might think, well, maybe the second one just overrides the first one. So let's let's make sure they're both being used. So I'll put a print statement in here, print first, and a print statement in here, print second. And I gotta run this guy, I'm gonna do that again. Yep, so you can see they're actually both being called. So on line nine, I call a function called sum, and I end up executing the first sum function that I declared starting on line one. On line 10, I call a function called sum, and I add a, end up running the second sum function. So what's going on here? Who can, who can make some guesses about why this might work this way? So, so the, you know, the, the reason, if you think about it, the reason that two variables can't have the same name is because then, in your program, when you assign a value to one of them, how does Java know which one you're talking about, right? So when we talked about functions, that idea made the same, made some sense, right? Like every function has a different name, and therefore when I call the function, Java knows what code I actually want to run. So when I call sum, Java needs to uh, figure out, okay, well, what is this code trying to do? What function should I go execute, okay? And the name, is one piece of information that Java uses to figure out what function I'm trying to call. If I put in a function that doesn't exist, when Java tries to execute my code or actually compile my code, it's gonna say, I don't know what you're trying to do, I can't find the symbol, call, symbol called soon, right? So it's using the name, that's definitely true. But based on this example, what other information is it using? This is the reason that I can have, yeah. The types, exactly, the types of the variables. So if you look at these two functions, there is something different about them. There's a couple things that are different. They have the same name. But the first one takes two integer arguments. The second one takes two double arguments. And that 
the argument types and the order of those types. So essentially, um, we look at how many arguments the function has and what the types of each argument are, sort of a list. Java also uses that to figure out which function to execute. So if I try something like this, now I'm gonna get an error. Java's gonna say you already defined that function, right? Now, what's interesting about this? You might say, well, wait, these functions still aren't the same. What's different about them now? Yeah. Yeah, the return type. One of them returns an int, the other one returns a double, right? You can see that just at the front of the function declaration. Right? So this is a good practice, right? This is a function called sum, it returns a double that takes two integer arguments. The return type, turns out, is not used by Java to figure out which function to run. And so these two functions are considered to be the same by the Java programming language. So now, now I have a problem. Now I really do have two functions with the same name. We sometimes refer to this entire, um, the entire information that Java uses to determine which function to run in this type of scenario as the function signature. So that consists of the name and the types of the arguments. Now I just want to make sure you understand something. This is important. The names of the arguments are irrelevant. So even if I, you know, put in a different name here, I still have a problem. The names of the arguments Java doesn't care about, right? Because that only matters inside the function. When the function is called, so essentially, when I get down to line nine, and I'm trying to call a function that takes two integer arguments, so when I call a function, Java knows the name of the function that I'm trying to call, and also knows the types of those arguments that I'm passing. Java will then be able to determine which one to use. If I don't have two, right? So if I, let's go back here, and let's make this one take doubles again. Now I'm fine, because, uh, well, I have, now I have another problem literally another problem. All right, good. Any questions about this? So, so this, is, this is something called method overloading. Many of you have written some Python code before. In Python, we have the uh, idea of default arguments for our methods. So you can provide, you know, certain default values for arguments. This is sort of Java's equivalent of being able to do this. So in Java, I can't provide default arguments for the arguments to a function, but default value. But I can define the same function multiple times. And this allows me to, you know, to essentially take uh, default arguments by one. But it's a less elegant way of doing it, but this is Java's way to do it. Any questions about this? Function signatures. So, so again, you know, when, when you read through code and you're trying to figure out what's going to happen, you come to a function call, you need to think about both the name and what arguments, what are the types of the arguments. That's the information that Java uses to figure out which function to run, and if you were trying to read through the code and understand the code flow, that's the same thing you do. So there's this last caveat here, though, that I want to point out. So let me go back to this example, okay? Let me get rid of this one. All right, so now what do we think is going to happen? Just, let's just think about it for a minute, and then we'll run it, and we'll see what actually does happen. So when I get down to line five, Java's looking for a function called sum that takes two integer arguments. That function doesn't exist. So one very plausible hypothesis about what's going to happen when I run this code is that there's going to be an error. It turns out that it runs fine. What happened here? I want to, you know, again, I want to sort of provide a hypothesis about what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, here's here's here was here was the thought process that the computer went through when it ran this code got to line five and it said, is there a function called sum that takes two integer arguments? And the answer is no. I haven't defined one of those. I had one, but I just got rid of it. Now I, all I have is a function that takes two doubles. So I says, okay, well, 
My first choice would have been to call a function that takes two ints. But that function isn't, it doesn't exist. Now the question is, can I safely confer, uh, convert the arguments to the function in a way that allows me to call some other function called sum? And here the answer is, is yes. Why? And also, since we're thinking about it, let's try, let's try it the other way, right? So let me keep this one, and I'll get rid of this one. Now what do you think is going to happen? Let's try it. Now I have a problem. It's really interesting, right? This, this version, if I, if I keep the one that takes doubles, I can pass ints to it. If, the, if I keep the one that passes, that takes ints, I can't pass them. The error message here actually is a good starting point for us understanding what's going on, right? So remember the difference between integers and doubles. Doubles store a value that has, has a decimal component. An integer and a long and a short all store numbers, whole numbers don't have a decimal component. So what is Java whining about here? What is it, what is it complaining about? What would it have to do in order to call, in order to make this function call that it's clearly unwilling to make? Maybe, let me put in some different numbers here. How about if I'm doing this? Okay. Yeah. It would have to destroy data. It's a great way to think about it. Yeah. So in order to call the version of sum that I have to find that takes whole numbers and pass in a number that has a decimal component, I have to convert the number with the decimal component, a double, to a number that doesn't have a decimal component, an int. And Java will not do this automatically for you. Instead, it will stop and say, wait, hold on. You're asking me to do something that could potentially cause loss of information because it says lossy conversion, right? So when we think about data in the world, and when we convert it from one format to another, sometimes we think about how much information is lost in the, in the process, right? So, you know, um, you guys, any, any of you remember DVDs? Ever, like, use one, touch one, have a DVD player? It's funny, my, um, my uh, mother-in-law just sent my wife she took in like some old VHS tapes and had it, had them digitized as something from her childhood, and so she sent she sent us these DVDs, and my wife was like really excited to get them because something she hadn't seen for a long time, and then she was like, "Wait, do we have a DVD player?" I was like, "No, why would we have one of those?" Um, anyway, but some of you remember DVDs, right? So one of the reasons why it was DVDs were um, it took so long for us to be able to distribute movies as DVDs is you actually have to take like if you it, and, and you can do this calculation. If you look at all the information that's in a movie, right, all the data that's collected when you film like a two and a half hour movie, squeezing it onto a DVD, reducing the amount of data so you can fit it onto a single DVD disc turns out to be really, really difficult. And in fact, there are sometimes even humans still involved in this process in ways that I, I, I won't bore you with. That's one of the reasons why it can still be fun to go see a movie in the theater if they have really good production, because the quality that they're showing you is higher, it turns out, than what you see on Netflix and even if you get a DVD or whatever, right? Just, does it matter most of the time? Eh, not really. I mean, movies move us usually even with, a good movie will move us even if it's blurry, right? But, you know, squeezing all that data down to be able to fit it onto something like a DVD turns out to be very difficult. And this is what Java's refusing to do automatically. It says, look, you gave me a double, there's some decimal data there. Presumably that information is useful to you. Otherwise, why include it in your program? And in order to call this function, I would have to destroy it. So I'm not gonna do that. Now, in this case, let's go back and look at the other example, right? Right? So why, why does this work, okay? So I can't take a double and convert it to an int. Why can't I take an int and convert it to a double? I have a whole number, yeah. Yeah, so there's no, there's no uh, potential loss of precision. 
right? If I take 20 and I want to convert it to, a, to a, a floating point number, I just say 20.0, and it's essentially the same number. It's actually not quite, but it's very close. Right? So taking a whole number and adding non-existent decimal data to it does not destroy any information, whereas taking a decimal number that might have some information past the decimal point and tossing that information does destroy data. Okay. So if Java can find a way to call a function without ruining data, it will do this. And I just talked through this. All right. All right. Let's let's. We have a couple. Of, like I said, there's a couple of little snippets of information to go over today. Right. I want to show you another really common programming pattern um, that I want you to internalize and use. Um, so when we start writing functions, one of the things that we frequently need to do before we can actually do any work is figure out if the person that called the function, the code that called the function, gave us information that is valid, that we can use. So we refer to this as fun function input validation. This happens at the very beginning of many functions. So they get, a, they get a couple of arguments, and they'll spend a little bit of time figuring out if those arguments are okay, if the values of those arguments are okay, right? So here, imagine I'm writing a function that's gonna sum an array of numbers. There's some work, it turns out, in Java that I probably need to do to make sure that numbers is an array that I can work with safely. One of the reasons for this, um, well, hold on, we'll get there, right? So one of the reasons for this is this unfortunate feature of the Java programming language. And this is something known as null, right? So uh, the, the, person res the, the person widely, um, widely credited with introducing null into programming languages has apologized, I think, multiple times for this. He has referred to null as the billion dollar mistake. And that figure is supposed to reflect the amount of, of the cost that null has imposed on programming civilization in terms of the amount of time spent solving problems created by it and fixing code that doesn't work because of it, and all sorts of other things, okay? So what is null? We haven't introduced null yet, okay? Um, what is null? Null, the best way to think about null is then, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about object and object references, but null essentially means that the value doesn't exist. It's undefined. And in Java, when I have an array, remember we, we mentioned that arrays sort of act like objects, I can assign the default value for an array is null. So I can do this. And then I, I can print the array. It turns out that's safe to do. But I can't do anything else with it. We'll see this in a minute. So Java has this special value that indicates that an object, this can only be used for objects, cannot be used for primitive types. But we've seen two objects so far, strings and any kind of array. This value indicates that the object hasn't been initialized yet. And again, null is not a valid object. If you try to uh, use one of its methods or properties, it, your program will crash. This is why null is so dangerous. This is what gives the billion dollars to the billion dollar mistake, is this feature of null, which is that if you try to use it, your program will crash, right? All right, so, so let's try this, okay? So here's an example. I'm using an array. I could replace this with a string. We'll do that in a second. My array is called output. I'm setting output to this special value called null. Now you can see this is another one of these reserved words in Java, so I can't call a variable null or whatever. It has a special meaning. I can print output. That is okay. But if I try to access the length of this array, normally if I have a valid array, I can get its length property, right? If I try to access the length of a null array, I get a null pointer exception. So this is, again, this is bad. This is a crash. This means, you know, somebody just uninstalled your app. You didn't get the third round of VC funding that you were hoping for. Uh, you didn't get the job at the company you were interviewing for because your code crashed because of a mistake like this. This is bad. Again, let me, so there's a difference between null and an empty array. So I can create a new array of integers that has zero length. Let me get rid of this for now, because it's less, less interesting. 
This is an empty array. Now, in Java, because you can't resize arrays, it's very rarely useful to create an empty array because there's nothing I can do with this, right? I can't store any data in it. The only thing I can do with it is print its length, which isn't very fun. Um, but this is different than setting the value to null, okay? No, so null, again, null basically means there's no array. An empty array says, okay, I've created an array for you and it just doesn't hold any data. A null array says, I haven't, cre I haven't even created an array for you. There's no array there, it doesn't exist. I'm trying to access its data, so let's, let's, let's do the same thing with the string. Let's set my string equal to null. And now we'll try to do something like print the string's length. If string's length is a, func a method, not a, not a property. Same thing. Um, I can't do anything with this string, right? I can't do care at zero. That's not going to work, right? Um, and it's gonna, it's gonna fail differently. The, clearly there's no string here, so there's no character at index zero, but the string doesn't even exist. So any attempts to use this are going to crash. All right. So let's go back to my, let's go back to our example here. And again, I'm still working on getting rid of all the static things. Okay, so this, this is fine, except it's not, it hasn't returned anything yet. So let's write this function. Let's write what we would have written, you know, up till this point. We're, I'm gonna leave this comment in here. We're gonna come back to this later. So you guys have done this, I think, on the homework problems. I can basically initialize a variable called sum. I can go through each number in the array. I add the sum and then I return it. Oop. What is happening with my M key? There we go. All right, so this will work. Let's, let's try it with some, with some valid arrays. We'll call um, sum that out and then the result of summing an array of values no I forgot a yeah I forgot something else okay there we go so I'm using the static array initializer syntax to just pass sum an array of integers and this works fine right I can sum an empty array Right? So if I give you an empty array, sum is zero. Now, again, probably the reason we talk about null and input validation in the same, at the same time is because handling null is going to allow us to avoid having this function crash. So who can give me an input to this function that will cause it to crash? Crashing is different than it being wrong, right? I might, you know, forget to add one number. I might start sum at one or whatever. There's lots of ways for this to be wrong. But who can give me a value that you can pass to this function right now that will cause it to crash? Again, this means that your app crashes. This means that, you know, the website goes down. Right? Um, it means that the self-driving car does something really bad. Right? Uh, hopefully it's standing still when this happens. Yeah. What can I pass to this? There is a value. This, this, this is great code, but there's one problem. I, if I'm, a, if I'm an attacker or just someone who's confused and doesn't understand how to use this function, maybe I got a bad input from the user or something, it's a con maybe it's not my fault, but I can make this function crash. How? Yeah. I could pass it null. No. Yeah. So remember, this function takes an array. Null no is a valid array. There we go, kaboom. All right, so I just made this function graph by just passing it this innocuous value. Okay, let's fix this. What are we gonna do? How am I going to make sure that this doesn't happen? So what do I need to do? All right, just describe it, right? And then we'll, we'll talk about actually how to do it. Yeah. Well, you're telling me how to write the code. I'm, I want to hear this in English. What do I need to do? Yeah. Yeah, I basically need to figure out a way to determine that the, that the uh, argument that you pass is null. And then if it is null, 
I want to do something like not enter this loop, because if I try to enter this loop, that's going to cause a crash. Right? Actually, let me rewrite this loop so you guys can see what's happening a little bit more clearly. Let me rewrite this with the uh, more traditional for loop syntax, and then we'll say numbers i. So now, I think it's more clear that if numbers is null, in order to execute this loop, I have to call numbers.length, and that is going to fail. So the way we check for null in Java, and again, we'll, we'll talk about this um, more when we talk about object references in a couple weeks, is like this. We can take the variable and we use double equals to just compare against null. That conditional will be entered if numbers is null. So if you or some confused person pass me nulls as this function, I can check to see if that argument is null. I can check with any argument that can be null. All right, so now what am I gonna do here? So now I can check, what, what should I do? It's not necessarily even a right answer to this question, yeah. So I've got that. So if, if you pass me a null, what, what should I return? I don't know, let's return zero or something. So this is, a, this is one of the problems uh, with Java. We don't, you guys don't know how to handle this properly yet. You will at the end of this semester, right? This, uh, handling this properly requires talking about exceptions, which we don't get to for, uh, for a while. Uh, but for right now, what we wanna do is we wanna return something inside that if statement because that's gonna prevent us from getting down into the block of code that starts on line five. So let's put like return zero. So now I've, take, I've taken care of that. So now if I run this, it's safe, right? It should still work. Let's make sure that we can actually pass a valid array. Let's say new int, let's pass in an empty array, make sure that works. Now let's pass an array that has some values in it. That also works. Questions about this example? Yeah. Uh, can I use a break statement on line three? Good question. Who wants to make an argument for or against it? Can I use a break statement on line? Can I use a break statement inside this conditional on line three? Breaks are only allowed in a loop. Yeah. So I'm not in a loop on line three, right? Um, but this is actually the right way to do it, right? Return is your friend here. Remember, as soon as I get to a return statement, I execute, I, sorry, I exit the function immediately. So the idea is on line two, I check if numbers is null. If it is, I get into that if statement, I hit that return on line three, and I'm done. I never touch any of the code that's done. Let me show you an alternate way of doing this that I don't like as much, but this is something that people will, you'll sometimes see, but people will do this, right? So now they'll, you know, and actually let's do this. Let's declare the sum outside this. So you can do something like this. And this will also work. Let's put our null back in here. This also works. I don't like it as much um, because if you, if you have a, you, because essentially the body of your uh, method is now inside this if statement, right? um, rather than outside. So the pattern I'm gonna encourage you guys to use is do something like this, where I, up here, I check for anything that could be wrong, and then down here I say, now execute the function, right? Now actually do the work that I'm trying to do. So this is the point up here where I check my arguments, and then I execute the function. There are other ways in which my arguments might be wrong, right? This is only one of them, but this is the pattern that I will create. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, do we test this on the MP? Oh yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the homework problems, right? We'll start to test. It's not hard, we'll, and, and we'll always tell you what to do, right? If we expect you to handle null in some way, we will tell you what to do if, if, we, if we throw a null at you, right? Um, this is one of those things where, you know, I'm sorry about it. I'm sorry that it's 2020 and we're still having to 
talk about this, but this is a reality of the world around us. There, there has been a huge amount of work that has gone into language design and different ways of improving um, the, the improving programming patterns around dealing with null. The reason is it's so dangerous, right? Um, we are gonna try to teach you to just be aware of it um, and to kind of figure out what to do, right? Make sure that you, whenever you have something that could be null, you check for it and you handle it appropriately, right? That will hopefully make it easier for you when you go on to work with other languages that also don't have good support for this, like, for example, C++, which we're using in 225. Python has a similar idea, right? Python has this, has this thing called none, right? People familiar with Python know about none. So none, and in some ways, acts similarly to null and causes similar problems. But to be honest, I'm really not sure why Python has that, but it does. So. Okay. Talked about null. Sweet. And again, we will help drill this into you through the homework, through the MP. Check for null. Always check for null. Right? Um, you know, and again, there are other languages you guys are going to work with that will really provide a lot more help when you're dealing with this particular problem. But you might as well get used to doing some of this on your own and thinking about it a little bit. Because it's a, re again, it's a, you know, if, if I was teaching this course 20 years from now, I don't think we'd be talking about this. This would be a solved problem. But it's not a solved problem. All right. Last little tidbit of information to cover today. Okay. So go back a few minutes and let's think about when we talked about method overloading. We pointed out that Java was unwilling to automatically convert a double into an int because that would require discarding that fractional component. But there are times in which you want that, right? There are times in which you're like, Java, I know what I'm doing. I really want to take this double and turn it into an int for whatever reason, okay? And there's a way to do this. The way is by applying what's called an explicit cast. So, and this is sort of like, I, I have, I never, I've never thought of this before. It's almost like casting a spell, right? Like you are forcing Java to do this. And by, and by including this uh, special notation, you are now taking responsibility for the situation. Java's like, I'm not doing that automatically. You apply a cast, Java's like, okay, right? Um, so here's the syntax that we can use online for, 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 for forcing Java to perform this conversion. Now, one important thing, particularly as you work on the MP, when you cast a double to an integer, it is not rounded, okay? We talked about this a little bit before. If you cast 10.9999999 to an integer, what value do you get? 10, you don't get 11. The decimal component is just discarded entirely. It doesn't matter how close you are to the next round number. Um, it is just tossed, right? If you want to round a number, you need to do that differently. All right, so again, let's, let's do this. Um, so again, I'll, I'll convince you of this. And then we'll print I down here. All oh, right, that doesn't work. So I can't automatically do it, but I can uh, do it using a cast. And again, 10.999, that decimal information is just discarded entirely. So if you need this, for some reason, you can force Java to do it. Of course, Java is at your command at all times. It is your tool. Uh, you are in charge. All right, so any questions at this point? About, I know we covered a couple of sort of disparate topics. Like I said, this is a bit of a cleanup class where we're just wrapping up a few topics before we move on to something else. Um, we talked today about method overloading, we talked about null and about defensive programming, and we just did a little bit about casting, right? So things that we'll see again in the future. Casting, not so much, but you'll need to use casting some, there are a few places on the MP where I think you'll need to apply it. Um, any questions about anything we talked about today? Uh, before we do, before we do a problem. Let's do a problem, okay. Let's reverse a string, right? Uh, and you guys will have more, you guys will have a chance to have some more fun with strings in next week's lab. But for now, let's think about how to reverse a string. So I've got a string, a sequence of characters, and essentially I want to put it in reverse order. So I want to flip it around. 
So someone described to me an algorithm for doing this. Walk me through it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so the idea is start with the string, convert the string into an array of characters, and it turns out there's a helper method on the string class that we can use to do that. Then I have an array. Then go through the array backwards and copy elements from that array into a new array, and then convert that new array back into a string. So that's one way to do it. All right, and, and why don't, for the sake of argument, why don't we try this, okay? So like I said, there, you know, this is a place where you might want to look a little bit at the string documentation. And let's, let's just look for array, actually, and see if I can, um, what is it called? Yeah, so, and, and if we were looking through this, right, um, might happen upon this method to care array. So you'll see this is a method that is provided on string objects, so any string has this. I can call this method. It takes no arguments. And what it returns is a character array. That character array contains all of the strings in, all the characters in the string, in the same order. So for, for a minute, let's just play with this, okay? So again, you know, whenever we start working on, working on writing code, when we're using unfamiliar functions, it's always useful to just kind of mess around a little bit. So let's just try calling to care array on an input string and printing what happens. All right. Okay. So it looks like, basically it looks like the original string, right? Now we should have an array, so let's try using the bracket notation to get a value out of it. Okay. And it looks like it's behaving like an array. I can use bracket notation. So here's the second character in the string at index one. Okay. So now, let's save that into a variable. So we'll say, let's call, I don't know, it's a character array, characters, let's call this forward. So you go to input.toCareArray. So now I'm saving this in a variable. What else am I gonna have to do here? So I have, now I have my characters in an array. In order to reverse the string based on this approach, what's the next kind of feature of this code that I'm gonna need to introduce? Common when working with arrays of data, I need a loop. So let's write our loop. Okay. And now let's print the character at that position in our character array. Okay, so this looks like it's doing the right thing. It's character by character. Okay. Now, here's where it gets a little more interesting. So I'm going to print the position, and then I'm going to print the character. So this is the position in the original array. So T is at index 0, I is at, e is at index 1. All right, so now we have to do a little bit of math and be careful about how we do this. What we're going to try to figure out is where should this character go in the reversed array? So let's start at the first character. So the last index in this array is 5. The first index is 0. Okay, so we're going to say int uh, reversed, I'm going to call this reversed index is equal to, this is some function of i. Right? So when I start at zero, I want to end up with five. That's the last place. When I get to the next character, I want to put that in four. When I get to the next character, I want to put that in three. When I get to three, I want to put it in two. So who can help me with this? What, 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 let, let's try this. It seems like we want to kind of start at the back and move forward. So let's start with, let's try this. We'll do forward.length minus i. And here I'm going to kind of indicate this is where I'm starting from. This is where it's going, and then there's the character I'm going to put there. Okay. So what's good about my the index where I'm going to put it? It's going backwards. I like that. What's bad about it? 
Is this correct or not? So this is the index that I'm going to take the character from, and it's the index I'm going to put the character into. What's wrong with this? Anybody see it? So my algorithm is I'm going to start with the character at zero, and I'm going to put it in position six in the new array. Is that going to work? No, because the new array is of size six. It's going to be the same size as the array that I have already, and six is not a valid index. So I need to correct this just slightly by subtracting one. Now I'm in better shape. All right, so if you guys need to leave, head out, I think there's not a class in here today, so I'm going to take like two more minutes to finish this. Let's create a new character array. And this needs to be the same size as the one that I'm starting with. Right? Okay? So now I have my character array, my reverse character array. I know where I'm putting things. And now I just need to make sure that things get into the right spot. I'm done. I'm going to print off the reverse. Oh, I got to hit new. All right, this looks right. I'll let you guys finish this on your own time. I have a couple of quick announcements that I will post on the forum for people that left late. Um, MP0 is out. Please work on it. The early deadline is this weekend on your deadline day, whether that's Sunday or Monday. I will see you guys on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend.